Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, DXBP webinar titled Success in Extending Extended Writing in Examination PE Hitting Mark Band 3. Um, for those of you that don't know, DXBPE is the professional development branch of DASA, uh, DASA being uh, the Dubai Affiliated School Sports Association. Thank you to DASA for financing and supporting this event um, on behalf of all of you in attendance. You can follow DASA and DXBPE on your regular social media platforms. Instagram and Facebook are the best places to keep up to date and find out what's going on. Um, please may I welcome Tony. Uh, Tony is uh, a senior examiner for GCSE PE and a moderator in A-level PE, A PE. So Tony's going to have some golden pieces of information for you today that will really help you and your students at school. In this session, uh, he's going to be covering, uh, it's going to take about one and a half hours, one to one and a half hours with question time. Uh, Tony's going to be taking us through examination paper construction, points-based versus level-based marking, and strategies for uh, extended writing to help your students get those best possible marks in those long answer questions. So before I hand over to Tony, uh, please note the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Um, not the chat, but the Q and A, please. Post any questions you have in there. Um, we will reply to them if we can live. Otherwise, there'll be phases in the, in the presentation where we'll stop and we'll visit those questions that you've been asking. On that as well, if you see a question someone has asked that you like, or you would also like answered, you can click it and give it a vote, a thumbs up, and that question will be moved up the rankings so we know which questions have the most demand so we can answer them first and foremost. Otherwise, we'll go hand over to Tony now, grab a cup of tea or whatever else might be your tipple at home this evening joys of Zoom CPD and uh, I'm going to turn my camera off and enjoy as well and uh, we hope you find this session enjoyable. Tony, over to you. Cheers, thanks Ed. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone or, or good evening for, for you guys over there. Um, what we're going to do, we are going to work through, as Ed said, uh, some strategies that you can use with your students for uh, the extended answer writing um, questions in, in GCSE PE. These, from a, a moderator's and examiner's point of view, are the, the ones where students really, really struggle. And what we need to try and do is give them some strategies and, and techniques and, and scaffolding uh, that they can use to try and aid the, the success in moving them up into Mark Band 2 and then into Mark Band 3 for, for the work. OK, so um, as we start, as Ed said, we're going to look at how the exam papers are constructed in terms of the assessment objectives one, two and three. So assessment objective one in terms of knowledge and understanding. Uh, assessment objective two in terms of the application of this knowledge and understanding. And then assessment objective three in terms of the analysis and the evaluation. We'll look at the difference between points based and levels based marking because some people may or, or may not be aware of this and the, the constraints in terms of how it affects the, the students uh, ability to to gain marks. And then finally, the strategies for extended writing um, in terms of me, uh, some of you may have, have seen me before when I came out to, to Dubai in 2019 to do some work for for Red Excel. Uh, I've been teaching since 2000, I've been a head of PE since 2008 and head of faculty since 2012. Um, in terms of my experience, I, I've taught in uh, a state grammar school in England, uh, I've taught in a comprehensive, I've taught in a pupil referral unit and I've also taught overseas in New Zealand for, for three years. So I've got quite a, a wide range of, of, of experience in educational settings. Uh, I've worked for Edexcel since 2010. That's in terms of examining and in terms of marking uh, as I've worked through I uh, started off just marking the papers and moderating uh, and then I've been a, a team leader on the PEP for the first two series I've also been a team leader on paper two uh, I've marked the A-level coursework as well in the old uh, series and also moderate A-level so as from that you can see I've got quite a, a wide range of, of knowledge and understanding in how exam papers work and, and the setup uh, particularly being a team leader on the paper two because we have three or four days where in a, in a normal <coughs> summer series, sorry, uh, we would go through and we would um, look at the mark scheme and make sure it's fit for purpose and fits the rubric of the, 
of the marks that are awarded for each question. Uh, in terms of the training, I've delivered uh, training for Edexcel from 2015 uh, until the end of 2019. Um, lots of sessions, either online or face-to-face -face in, uh, in England. Uh, I've also been out to, to Dubai and also out to, to Vietnam to the Fabicia Conference uh, to deliver some training sessions over there. Uh, and I recently delivered some training for the Fabicia and BSME schools uh, for the conference that was held uh, online at the end of January. Um, hopefully you'll find this session helpful and hopefully you'll find it uh, useful for you and your students. And then finally, um, I'm currently on sabbatical at the moment from, and that has allowed me to set up my company called GCSE Simplified. Uh, some of you may or may not have seen our books. I know some of you use our books. Uh, so we uh, have now written uh, 12 A-level uh, GCSE, BTEC and Cambridge National Guides, all spec specific, all cover the details for the, uh, for the, courses that the students um, work with. Uh, we currently work with about 1,500 schools in England and about a, another 100 uh, internationally in 24 uh, countries across the world. So in terms of currently, obviously, uh, we, we've got exams that have been cancelled again. Uh, this is despite just before Christmas, the DfE and, and Gavin Williamson saying that this definitely would happen. Uh, I was on a, a session on Friday. Uh, the thing that you need to be aware of at the moment is exams are cancelled in terms of England. But currently, if your students do GCSE exams, then they haven't been cancelled for overseas centres. IGCSE exams are still due to run. Uh, but currently there hasn't yet been a decision made with regards um, exams being run. So if you do GCSE PE for Edexcel or you do GCSE PE for AQA, then at the moment the decision has not been made or taken as to whether or not your students will or will not sit those exams. Um, now from the course or the, the session that I was involved with on Friday, uh, the information that I have is that the decision will be made about this sometime this week. Uh, and I've spoken to Ed about this already. And I said, in terms of if the exams are cancelled, I'd be quite happy to just go through what this means for you and what you need to do for your students. Uh, in England at the moment, the cutoff day for uh, exam mark submission is the 18th of June. And that would be the same if the um, same provisions are put in place for your centres overseas as they are currently in England. But this is a case to just watch this space really, but the decision should be made by Ofqual and DFE by the end of this week. So the end of Friday um, sometime, then the decision will be made and it should be made available for everyone. So in terms of the exam, uh, GCSE PE, irrespective of uh, whether or not you do AQA, uh, OCR or LXL, there are four components. So the first component is fitness and body systems. This is paper one. For Red Excel, this comprises 36% or for AQA, 30%. Paper two is health and fitness. So 24 for, for Ed Excel or 30% of the entire qualification for, for AQA. Then you've got your practical performance, which is the remaining 30%. And then finally, the, the PEP or the, the AOP for, for AQA, which is the, the final 10%. Um, this gives you the 100% total uh, through the course, and it's marked either out of two, uh, 350 for, for Red Excel and 256. Uh, the marks are available per component, and there is some scaling. So, for example, it's uh, on the PEP, it's 1.75. On the practical performance, it's just one. Um, so the scaling is different for each of the papers or each of the components. Um, now, again, if the amendments are made for yourselves, uh, I can make available something that I've managed to get hold of, which is changes to the to the scaling or the, the components waiting uh, for this year. Uh, and I'll, I can pass that on for Ed for, for yourselves. Um, I don't want to really talk too much about the, the sort of process at the moment, um, because, again, it might vary for yourselves. Uh, so this is what would normally happen in a normal exam series, uh, which hopefully we might get back towards something that resembles normality for next year. Now, the assessment objectives split the course into different sections. So you've got AO1, which is knowledge and understanding, and that accounts for 25% of the entire GCSE. Now, the and understanding is important because the students may have the basic knowledge, but they don't understand what that means. And if they don't understand what that means and how it applies to sport, then they will struggle for the assessment objective too, which is the application of this knowledge and understanding. That then forms 20% of the course. Assessment objective three, 
is the analysis and the evaluating factors, which is 15%. And then AO4 is the demonstrate for practical. Again, this tops up to 100%. And this is the same regardless of the board followed. However, if you do Cambridge, uh, so CIE, so IGCSE, this is different because there is no coursework. So there is no PEP, there is no uh, AEP, there is no AOP. So this is slightly different if you're following the IGCSE spec. Okay, as you can see, the course is split 60-40, theory to practical. But in many respects, if you're looking at the, the practical of the 40%, you've got 10%, which is a theoretical piece of coursework. So in effect, really, is 70-30. Uh, IGCSE, again, as I said, is different with the, the one exam in the 50-50 split and it's slightly different in terms of the, the sports that are, you're able to do. So we, we do for edXL, we do three. IGCSE, then they, then they do four. Um, a lot of international centres are starting to look at the, the IGCC more so uh, than have been previously in the last three or four years. It's, a, it's quite a, a large number of, of uh, schools moving away from um, AQA, EdXL, OCR and moving towards Cambridge IGCC. So in terms of... Tony, sorry to interrupt you there. Just a good opportunity to perhaps launch this poll and find out which exam boards everybody is teaching. Is that all right if we do that? Yeah, now? that's fine. Ed. No problem. Right, so um, everyone, you should get a poll popped up now in the middle of your screen to allow you to vote on um, which exam board you do. I'm going to leave that running and then um, can allow Tony to continue after I've rudely interrupted him. But um, once you've all finished voting, we'll be able to see uh, exactly the, the split between you all. And I think, Tony, that will that'll probably help you as well as you're going yep. through knowing where everyone's done. I can already see... Can you see the poll, Tony? Yes. Yes. Uh, I can't see the results of it yet, though. Oh, okay. Right. So, um, twenty-four out of almost everyone's voted. It's looking like we've got a lot of EdXL. Um, I'll let you carry on, Tony, and then uh, I'll I'll interrupt you again in a moment. All right. No worries. That's great. Ed. Thanks. Um, so, in terms of the the paper construction, so component one, uh, thirty six percent of the entire course, uh, it was decided in the initial consultation in two thousand and fourteen that they would put more weight in on the anatomy phys, um, because it was it was viewed by many teachers as it was the the sort of most important area. Uh, so this gives thirty six percent of the the total uh, course mark for AQA. It's thirty. They have evenly weighted papers, and as you can see, the exams are, are longer. Um, shorter for AQA and there's more marks available. So in terms of the assessment objectives, those are the, the splits. So, so these con these constructions uh, help the way that the, the paper is formatted. So yeah, just the, the polls coming up. So there's the vast majority uh, are doing edXL, uh, IGCSE second and then AQA third. Um, A-level tends to be a, a split between AQA uh, and edXL for, for A-level PE. Uh, and then the IB as well. Okay, that's great. So in terms of the, the paper construction, the assessment objective two is 12 and 10%, and then AO3 is nine and seven. So this gives you your 36 and your 30%. So depending on the number of, or the percent of, of AO1, AO2, AO3 that are available for the paper will determine the weighting of the the questions and, and whether or not they are an AO1, an AO2 or an AO3. And I'll, I'll look at that and talk about that a little bit more just when we get through the next couple of slides. So component two, which is the health, fitness and well-being in effect, the, the second paper, the paper two, EdXL is 24%. But as you can see, it's equally weighted for, for AQA, it's 30-30. Same marks for um, AQA and it's the same length of time paper as paper one for AQA. For EdXL, it's a shorter paper, it's 30 minutes shorter, um, and it's also worth less marks. Again, the construction is 10 or 12% for AO1, your, your, your knowledge and understanding component. AO2 is eight or 10%, and then six or 8% for, for the final application and analysis section. Gives you 24 and 30%. So that's how they construct the papers in terms of the, the weighting for the assessment objectives. Now, in terms of the two papers, the multiple choice, now multiple choice are mainly AO1 or AO2, but they can be 
AO3 question. So you would normally get one of those if you had a data question where you would look at a graph or a chart or a table and you would be asked to, from the information that was there, analyse what the answer would be. So you're looking at the information and then even though it's only a multiple choice question, uh, you've got four options that would formulate and it would give a AO3 type question. You have short answer questions which are worth one mark. So these are one word answers or simple statements. So it might be uh, you have a, a, a drawing of the skeleton, there's a, an arrow going to uh, a section of it and you're asked to um, answer the question as to which bone is it. And then the follow up question to that might be which classification of bone would this be? So sometimes you have short answer questions that are also linked. In terms of longer answer questions, these are two, three or four marks. This is where you start to get linked sentences needed. And the command words mainly here are describe, explain and analyse. And this again is looking at past papers. So the papers that are, um, are available from 2018 and 2019. So these three command words, describe, explain and analyse are the most common for the longer answer questions. So please don't get um, the longer answer questions confused with the extended writing questions. They are actually different. And then the extended writing questions for uh, Edexcel, there are two. For AQA, there are one. These are always at the end of the, of the paper. Um, and these need to focus on developed paragraphs. And I'll talk about scaffolding and how you can get your students to write developed paragraphs later. Um, if the students don't start to develop paragraphs and link the AO1, 2 and 3 uh, pointers together, then they will struggle to move into the, the upper mark band. So you're looking at, at six marks and above, really. Um, so develop paragraphs are a key for success in the, develop, or the extended writing. So the assessment objectives are hit with a range of these questions. Uh, as I said, most multiple choice at AO1, just a recall of knowledge. It's basically there's a statement, there's a question there, um, and you have to answer, or the student has to answer, and show that they actually know the answer to that. And it's dead, dead simple. But depending on whether or not it's a database question, then they could actually hit AO3. So the data questions uh, can be any marked tariff, could be uh, one mark, as I said, a multiple choice or well, they could be six marks, it could be a linked question for eight marks, and it depends on the length and the complexity of the question. Now, quite often when we come to mark these, if the student gets the first question wrong in terms of the data, in terms of what does the graph say, what does the chart say, what does the table say, then subsequently they will get the following bits of the question wrong. So even though they're only getting the, the initial question wrong, then they might um, fail to get any more marks out of the, the remaining six or seven uh, marks that are, are, are available. In some cases on the mark scheme, it will actually say, if question one is incorrect, then take the answer that they give to see if it would in the correct context be okay. So again, it depends on the mark scheme that is available. Um, other times it might be, if you get paid, if you get the first part of the question wrong, then the rest of it you will get incorrect. So it depends on the mark schemes, whether or not they would be able to access any marks if it is a, a linked complex question. These are often used to assess uh, assessment objective two or three. So there's the chart, what does it say? Can you apply your knowledge and understanding to say the answer and then the link from there? And it might be simple question like this. So uh, income from different sources for European football clubs in 2015. Uh, it shows commercial match day and media. And then just a very simple question to say, which club receives the highest match day income? So again, it's making sure that the students look at the graph, the, the bar chart that is there. They make sure that they look at the right uh, um, section in there, go across, read it, and then they just simply put the answer down. Okay, so any questions so far? This is a, a section, if there's any questions that we've got so far, then we can we can look at uh, answering some of the questions here. Is there any questions that have come up, Ed? Any recurring yeah, so questions? There's, there's nothing in the Q&A box as well at the moment. Um, okay. I know that some of the people here today are brand new to the course, so I haven't started it yet, but everyone, we, we will move on, but this is just an opportunity that if you do have any questions, please uh, pop them in that Q&A <laughs> box at the bottom there and um, if not we, we'll crack on and um, move on towards whatever Tony's got planned next okay no problem so if you've got any questions about the construction of the paper and 
you think about them later down the line on um, after what I say next time, then is we can uh, come to them then. Uh, the assessment objectives differ for Cambridge. So in terms of the, the papers, they are uh, split 50-50. Um, there's only the assessment objectives one to three because there is no coursework. Um, so for um, Edexcel, OCR and AQA, um, then obviously you've got your, your sort of written coursework that you have in terms of the PEP, uh, the, the AEP um, and the AOP. Um, so that does actually differ slightly for... Um, just reading the question, so just bear with me, please. Yeah, so um, the questions, what I'll do is I will come to the construction of the questions in the, the, the last bit of the, the presentation. So in terms of how the, the questions are constructed, then we'll look at that towards the end. So don't, don't worry about the construction. We'll look at taxonomy of um, command words and things like that. So we, we will cover that. So just going back to what I was saying in terms of the assessment objectives, because IGCSE doesn't have the coursework, then the percentages are different. So they only have assessment objectives one, two, and three. So there is no assessment objective four for the, the Cambridge National. So in terms of the longer questions and the command words, so these are longer three or four mark questions. In AQA, it could be a six mark question. And these use points-based mark schemes. Okay, so again, typical command words are explain and describe and the responses need to be linked. So this is where a student may formulate an answer and they start off with an A01 point. So uh, it might be something along the lines of um, the skull uh, protects the brain in terms of uh, the role of the, the bone. Um, they then they apply that knowledge, for example, um, it would absorb an impact from a tackle in rugby. This would allow, and this is how the development of the answers would be, uh, f would be written and constructed by the students. In terms of written answers, what we find is when we mark quite often, uh, the students, I would, and I would class this as a, a shotgun approach, they basically say, right, I've got all this knowledge, I've, this is what I want you to know. And irrespective of the question, they just put as much down as they can. But if they're going to score into sort of the upper mark bands and be able to access sort of a seven or eight or a nine in terms of the marking, then there's some thought that needs to be given to how they construct their answer. So in terms of when they're actually writing their answers, then connectives are massively important to be able to link the assessment objectives the knowledge and understanding, the application of the knowledge and understanding, and then finally the analysis and the evaluation of this. If they can write in prose, so they write in, in full sentences that link together and it flows nicely, then their answer is the potential to get into three marks, into four marks, into five marks, into six marks, whatever the tariff is for that question. And there's just a few examples here of, of connectives that you might want to speak to your students about. Your students might use these already, um, but if they don't, there's just some examples here of, of what you can get them or examples they could use within their answers. And it might be that after this, you may do some work with your students about connectives in, in the written answers. And you might say, right, for this time in this question, I would like you to uh, put, however, on the other hand, despite, whereas you ask them a different question, and it might be in the same way, similarly, likewise. So you're focusing on, on certain connectives that you might want your students to, to use within certain types of questions when they're putting their answers together. Now, as I've said, in terms of the, the mark scheme that is uh, constructed by the exam board, irrespective of, of the exam board, then there's always point and levels based marking. So the point based marking, and if you don't know what this is, don't worry about it because I'll explain it. If there is an appropriate point made, then the student will get a mark for that. So if um, the question is, for example, for one mark, um, state or name a long bone, and they come up with the name of a long bone, so the femur, uh, for example, then they would get a mark. Now, if a student names another different long bone, then that is OK, so long as it is a long bone, then they will still get a mark for that. So the mark is award awarded for a point that is made and any valid answer is taken. So the students may give different answers, different students may give different answers, but that is okay because they're all valid. And so long as it hits the points made in the mark scheme, then they will get credit for that. 
levels based marking only applies to the extended answer questions so it's only for the nine mark questions and this is slightly different than a points based marking so it's indicative content but it isn't one mark per point made and the reason that i say that is that because the the way that the um, assessment objectives are given over for um, the nine mark questions for edXL it's three 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 in terms of assessment objective one two and three in terms of AQA it is two two five so if a student makes five or six uh, knowledge and understanding points then the most points they are going to score if they do edXL it would be three if they do AQA it would only be two so it isn't necessarily one point per mark that is made and they assess all three of the assessment objectives that are in there. And this applies, as I said, to both AQA and edXL. So when you look at the, the mark scheme, you need to be aware of this. Um, quite often when we mark, you might have a student makes numerous um, A or one points, but they max out at two or they max out at three. So in effect, it's just a, a waste of time because they would be better off using um, their three first points that they make or two for to AQA um, and then developing those paragraphs and extending it and linking in the application and the, the analysis and the evaluation of that knowledge. Now in terms of how the students mark it's the quality of the response overall so it might be that a student scores if you were to go on a points based mark scheme uh, five or six marks um, but the actual quality of the response is only worthy of level uh, of, of four marks, sorry, but it's still placed in level two, but they wouldn't get the full six, six marks. Similarly, they might have made a, written a response that would, if it was points based, score it at a seven. But actually, when you look at the quality of the response and how the flow of the question goes, it isn't worthy of a, a level three mark in terms of the, the the level based as opposed to points based and it may only score five or six and again this is just down the the more you can um, practice marking then the the more uh, knowledge you will gain in this and the more you will be able to spot it within your students uh, responses now something that may be uh, a, a piece um, or a technique that you could use is that you actually write a, a response that fits into the levels based marking and give it your students give them the mark scheme and actually ask them to mark it and you could do that as well within the class you could do peer based marking and it's just about getting the students to understand that just because they've made nine points they've made nine points in their response they're not necessarily going to score nine marks because if they actually read their question back or the, their answer back to the question it isn't worthy the quality of the response overall isn't worthy of, of level three or, or full marks. So the mark is then awarded dependent on the development of the answer. So again, this linkage is key. The development, the paragraph, the developed paragraph is key. The response has to flow from the, the knowledge and understanding into ultimately the analysis and the evaluation. So what does it mean? It's okay making a point, but ultimately, how can they apply that? And what is the impact and the impact can be either to the to the question or it can be to the sport that is being discussed. And as I mentioned for, for edXL, AO1 is worth three, AO2 is worth three, AO3 is worth three. So this gives you your nine marks. And we'll come to some examples of, of developed paragraphs and how you can scaffold and structure for your students a little bit later. And AQA is AO1 is two. AO2 is two and AO3 is five. So as you can see, if you've got students that are only able to, to apply the knowledge and understanding, for edXL, they can potentially score up to six marks. For AQA, if you've got students in all, that can only apply and um, the knowledge and understanding, then potentially they're only going to be able to, to score four marks. So potentially, depending on the type of student and the, the way that you uh, structure the scaffolding and the way that you structure your teaching to this, then it may be more difficult for your students to access mark band three and level three for AQA. And as I said, you know, the, the look or the way that you look at it is that it does make it more difficult to get into the upper mark band for, for AQA. Okay, so there's probably some questions. Anyone got any questions then just about 
the sort of constraints or the constructions between levels and points based marking. Okay, right. So what we'll do is we'll move on. If there's any any questions that come up, um, please feel free to ask them. Um, Ed, do you want to put that poll up? Thank you. Okay, so the reason that this is in, um, when we um, go through the, the mark schemes for um, the extended answer questions, out of nine, the average is always less than three. For the last two series, it's been uh, 2.4 on, on average. Um, and that really points or flags up a few issues in my mind. Uh, number one, is the question appropriate for the students? Um, are they able to, to access it? Uh, and then secondly, number two is, are we teaching it in a way that the students can access, that they can then scaffold their, their answers and then move up into sort of four to six marks, seven to nine marks. Now, if you don't know what the, the average um, marks are for your students, then you can um, access via the exams officer uh, for Edexcel Results Plus. Uh, there's the same um, process or the, the same service that's available for, for Edexcel as well. Uh, similarly, as in Exam Wizard for, for Edexcel and, and Exam Pro for, um, for AQA. And it will allow you to be able to, so the average that we've got there is four to six. Okay, so in effect, your students are scoring more highly than the average um, that comes across for students in, in England. Um, now that might be the, the better to articulate in their answers. It might be in terms of the way that you deliver their teaching from it. Uh, it might be the repetition of, of, of questions that they do, or it might be that the students are simply at a higher level than the, the students in England. These are all potential answers uh, for that question. But I think, you know, it's always good to know that your students or where your students are, in, are at in the previous series to how you can help the ones that you are with uh, and teaching to currently. So in terms of the extended answer questions, as I said, it's levels based marking and it requires the same skills as a long answer question. So the students have to link and develop and, and demonstrate in their response knowledge and understanding. But the application and the impact of it is, is key. If you can get your students to think all the way through the work, what is the impact of this on an elite performer at any level of question, then they will sort of be easy for them to get their head around what the question means but also it should be able or easier for them to be able to get a more successful answer so the impact is key what is the impact on the elite performer what is the impact on the sport and that is the driver that you should try and hammer home to your students when you when you're working with them okay so this is just a, a sort of recap again what i was saying about the the link between the assessment objectives so the developed paragraph, what I try and say to my students is, if you were in your class now, you've got 30 students, say to them, say to the students, uh, yes, this is uh, being recorded. Uh, Tom, this is being recorded, so you will be able to, to watch it back if you need to. If you get your students to put their hands up and say, right, who thinks a nine mark question is hard? guarantee pretty much all of them, if not all of them, will put the hand up. If you say to them, okay, right, let's rejig, let's reframe this. Three marks, three marks, three marks, that's nine marks, right? Who thinks now three, three mark questions is easier than one nine mark question? And pretty much every same student will put their hand up. So in effect, what you need to do is get the students to reframe. It isn't a nine mark question. It's a series of three, three mark questions. Um, that's especially true for Edexcel. It's slightly different for, for AQA in terms of the way that the assessment objective weighting is given, but you could still for AQA say that it's a four and a five. And I think that is easier for the students to get their heads around rather than a nine mark question. So in terms of common issues that arise when we're marking these, the, the misinterpretation of the question is, is massive. The students don't know what the command word is, or they might struggle with what the command word is, or they, they might struggle with what the question is actually asking. So when you, when you read their answer, 
it's a good answer, but the problem is it doesn't answer the question. And a good example of that was uh, 2019, there was a question on about a sedentary lifestyle and physical health. And a lot of students were writing about a sedentary lifestyle and they were talking about being overweight and obese. And then they started talking about diet. Now, while what they are saying or what they were saying was correct, it didn't answer the question. It was talking about a sedentary lifestyle on health. So it was talking about issues related to posture. It was talking about issues related to muscle wastage. It was talking about issues related to um, weight bearing activity or a lack of it and the, the long term impact of that. What the students were then interpreting or interpreting the question to be was if someone is sedentary, they sat down watching TV. They might then go and get a packet of crisps, a can of pop, a load of sweets, and then that will cause them to put weight on. So that is a misinterpretation of the question. While the points they were making were correct, it wasn't answering the question. And this is a common issue for the students. Interpretation of the command word as well. This is a big issue. Quite often uh, they get the command word wrong and then as a result, they answer the question incorrectly. So there's a little slide after this, which is about the taxonomy of command words um, and again use it with your students it explains the words and it also tells you which um, assessment objective the command words are, are likely to hit from simple ones for AO1 to more complex for, for AO3. All right so if it was me teaching it I would actually teach them the command words and I would explain them to them and go through the taxonomy of them. So if a question is discuss what does discuss mean? How does discuss differ from identify? What does state mean? What does name mean? Very simple ones up to analyze and evaluate. And again, quite simple. It might be something you drip feed in from day one of your course, or it might be you explicitly teach this within a lesson or two. And the impact of the these misinterpretation of command words and the questions are that students don't score the marks that their knowledge potentially warrants. They might not be able to get up over four marks out of nine because they've written an answer, only half of it is right. The other half, while right for what their interpretation is, doesn't answer the actual question. So they fail to secure the, the marks they should. Okay, so in terms of the common issues, so the principal examiners from all major examining boards report students inability to satisfy the command word is a major reason reason they don't meet their target grade or their predicted grades uh, there was some research done uh, in the last two years especially with everything that's happening at the moment in terms of uh, teacher assessed grades or what was classed as last year as, as center assessed grades and that only 30 percent of predicted grades were correct and they were trying to work out what the reasons were behind this and they were saying that many students don't understand the question and they don't understand the question fully because they don't understand the command word. So they don't understand the key word that is in there that will help them to answer the question. So the students are regularly underlining um, the command word. So they're identifying it, that's okay, that's not a problem, but then they're not satisfying the needs of the command word in their answer. The students are analysing or being analytical um, in the techniques before starting to write their answer. So they're not able to understand fully the questions. Now, this is from the, the principal examiner's report that is uh, from the 2019 series for, for Edexcel. And this is for paper one. And it just says, use the command word and number of marks available to help you decide the depth required in your example. For example, uh, or answer, sorry, uh, for example, state questions do not need descriptions. Make sure, another point again, make sure you read questions carefully. For example, you do not need to explain when you describe. Paper two is exactly the same. Use the command words and number of marks allocated to each question, and then pay attention to the command word in the question and the marks all allocation, allocated. Describe, explain and discuss will need more detail, link responses and will be worth more marks. So again, there's two different principal examiners for, for paper one and for paper two. They're both coming up and they're both flagging the same points that the students are uh, uh, failing to meet the needs of the command word. And as a result, then they're not answering the question 
in sufficient detail. So in terms of command words, these are regularly occurring command words. Okay, I'm just reading the questions. I haven't fallen asleep. Don't worry about that. Um, so these are regularly, regularly put my teeth in, occurring command words. And what I've done is I've broken it down into AO1, so basic questions, basic knowledge and understanding questions. The AO2, which are the, the shorter ones potentially, um, that then develop into the, the longer questions. And then AO3, analyze, compare, discuss, evaluate, uh, and justify. So these are the ones that regularly occur for the AO3 and the extended answer questions. So that's a, this will be available for you at the end. What I'll do is I'll send this across to Ed as a, as a PDF. So if you wanted to print this out and use it with your students, get them to stick it in at the, the front of the, the book or the folder um, and then get them whenever they're doing any work, make sure you, you sort of hammer home the fact that they need to identify the command word for every question and it will become uh, habitual then and, and that is, is what you want. So in terms of the extended answer questions, this is again from, from the Edexcel uh, paper one. And the next one we've got, this is from the previous uh, series in 2019. Now, one of the issues obviously that we've got as, as teachers is because the exams have been canceled for, for 2020 and then 2021, then we've got a lack of past papers. Um, the papers that were sat by students that, that resat. Uh, the option or they had the option to, to reset in November. Those papers are now available for both um, AQA and for Edexcel. So we've now got three series of, of exam papers. Interestingly, though, in terms of if you're planning for exam cycles and exam content, then the paper that was sat in uh, November was not the paper that was planned to be sat in the summer. So in terms of exam cycles and content and gaps in content and, and identification of weaknesses, then the three year cycle of exam uh, papers, because the entire content is supposed to be delivered and tested within three years has not yet been fulfilled. So as you can see, if you're looking at the, the upper mark bands there, so seven, eight, nine marks, you've got less than 7% of the students were able to access mark band three for question number one, for, which was question 13. And then question 14 is even less. So if you're looking at the top end, there was only 48 students out of 24,000 were able to gain nine marks out of nine for that question. So again, there's two aspects there that, that need to be looked at. One is the question fit for purpose if that few students can, so 0.2% of students are able to fully answer the question. Is there something wrong with the question or is there something wrong with the way that, that we as, as teachers, we as sort of PE teachers are, are delivering work on this? And I think it's a combination of the two, if I'm, if I'm being totally honest. And I include myself in that uh, when I was, was teaching and delivering for my students. This one was even worse. Uh, this was the extended answer questions for, for paper two. Um, as you can see, again, the top end, so uh, mark band three for question 14, which was about feedback. It was 1.5% of students were able to access that. Um, and three students, so not 3%, three students answers out of 21 and a half thousand were able to access nine out of nine. Now, the reason that there's less students um, on this one than the previous slide. So the previous slide was 24,000 is there would have been 3000 students sit the short course, uh, which is basically an amended um, paper one um, and they don't do the paper two. So in terms of if you, if you were doing the short course in a normal series, so not sort of the sort of madness that we've had for the last two years, um, they would do two sports. They do no uh, pep and they do the, the, the short course paper, which is topics one, two and three for paper one or component one, sorry. Um, question 15 about the sedentary lifestyle um, impacts, slightly better answered, but not much. Uh, again, as you're looking at 1.6% of, of 21 and a half thousand students are able to access Mark Band 3 with 15 out of 21,000 responses warranting full marks. So I think what we need to do is we need to, to look at what we're doing. And as you can see, your students, if they're looking at sort of four or six uh, marks average for these questions, they would be sitting right in the middle there. 
there's many students don't access any marks at all. That's generally from students not actually answering the question. Um, quite often when we get papers through um, and it's all done electronically now, unless there are special consideration papers, um, they just don't answer the long answer questions at the back. Uh, now that might be for a, a number of reasons. Uh, it might be they don't understand the question. It might be they can't be bothered. It might be they've been made to sit PE and they just really don't want to. So they just thought, oh, I'm not doing it. Um, but quite often it is because they don't understand the question. And if you look at the command word and you look at the taxonomy and you look at what was said in the principal examiner's um, uh, reports, then it's quite clear that it's a recurring theme that the command word isn't fully understood and neither is the way that the students need to, to focus and, and structure the question. Okay, I'm just going to look at the, the, the Q&A box up here for a minute. So again, I'll, I'll just try and see if there's anything in there. Um, so any advice where to find resources on extended writing? Okay, uh, we'll cover how to access that Catherine in a minute. I've also put um, some links on there as well in terms of um, exam board specific um, resources that you can use to answer or get them to, to look at the command words. There's also one on, on BBC Bite Size as well, which is, is quite good. Um, John, that question you've got about uh, marking a state question, uh, if they state the answers uh, and a description. Yep. So uh, when you when we mark, there is no negative marking. Um, so if they state um, the answer, as in name the bone, for example, then yep, that is the, the mark that is given. So if they describe what a long bone is, for example, um, then they won't lose a mark for that because there is no negative marking. And this is the same across all the exam boards. Um, and quite often, when they put an answer down, if they're unsure of, of the answer, depending on the mark scheme, it might be that it's, it says uh, accept the first answer that is given, or it might be accept any answer that they gave or they have given. Um, so if they get the first one wrong, it might be that that's OK and the second one's right, or it might be vice versa. If they get the first one wrong, that's the only one that you read. But again, the get them to if you can get the students to to fully understand the command word then it should help them when they are answering the question as to what the requirements of that actual question are um common issues on extended answer questions quite often in terms of if you if you're writing a more complex question especially within edxl because if you think if there's 70 marks on paper two there's 18 marks available. So there's more than a quarter of the entire paper is given away to, to two, two questions. They need to write in prose. They've got to make sure that the, the answer flows. It's structured, it's um, well constructed. There's no spag marks now, so don't worry too much about that. However, quite often, the actual uh, writing of the students is an issue um, in terms of being able to read it. Now, the, what happens is if a student um, has written a, an answer and the examiner can't read it, they will then submit that to their team leader for, for secondary marking. If the team leader can't read it, that'll get passed on to the APM and if they can't read it, it, it gets zero. So I think quite often, um, a lot of times students rush the writing, try and get them to focus and, and taking the time on writing because it is worth it. Because if you can't read the answer, then it won't score any marks. And if you think about a teacher marking quite often, um, we get about four and a half thousand um, answers to mark. So we have a lot of marking to do in quite a short space of time. So if it's taking ages to read, um, then that could negatively impact the, the um, ability of your students to, to get marked. The lack of analysis and evaluation of the topic is key. So the knowledge and understanding might be there. They can apply it in some respects, but they can't actually say what the impact is on the performer and the lack of developed responses. So there's they may be getting um, saying about the, the impact of um, balanced diet on a on an endurance athlete. They're talking about different components of a balanced diet, but they're not saying ultimately what the impact of that would be on a performer. Okay, just look at the questions that have come up again. So just bear with me, please. Tony, I had a question. I can't post in the Q&A. So, okay. Um, what's, do the exam boards have a, a target percentage that they 
expect when they make these papers for students to be getting eight and nine out of nine because those statistics you showed then were a bit shocking really that you know three or five kids out of 24,000 are getting top marks is yeah, what, they, what are the exam boards doing about that what is their target they're really bad aren't they um they're the lowest ones that I've ever seen to be honest they're always quite low even when um the old spec the what the classes the legacy spec was was on and we had six mark questions um the average was usually two 2.4 so as it's gone up to nine the average hasn't actually gone up any um even though there are more um more marks available they don't necessarily have an average that they want to get but what they do is when each um uh paper is is marked and then each component is marked they put the marks together that's how they construct the the overall grade boundaries and then they have um um a sort of idea or a, an amount of students a, a percentage that they know that they can have as a nine as an eight as a seven as a six that kind of thing um so in terms of sort of the average mark that they want the students to get i would say they want them to get as high as possible um but i think the accessibility of the questioning needs to be answered or needs to be addressed really um the nine mark question that was in the the november series and there was only for edxl there was only 57 students sat that exam because obviously they changed the way they awarded the grades from the sort of algorithm to the the center assess grades um there was a nine mark question on basketball and muscle fibers um now i've seen a question similar to that were four marks in previous exam series but i think a nine mark question on muscle fibers is very very difficult um now i've read a, a couple of um answers responses from some schools that i'm in contact with over in singapore um there were good answers um but the kids were getting six now i would say um i didn't see any that were were in mark band mark band three so i think you know the the exam boards have got to look at the the way that they, they're tackling the the issue with the questions um but it's not necessarily percentage they want to get into each band but it's more overall but um even when you you get your you sort of pass paper students back or and you can check this on results plus even the more able students uh, that i've had within my cohort and I, i'm talking about students have got nines they're only getting sixes really on the on the extended writing question so i think you know do i look at what i'm doing I've, but i do think the examples need to to look at what um questions are putting forward that one on the respiratory system for a tennis player was very tricky um, the one on uh, methods of training for a shot putter was was vague in my opinion um, and I don't think sometimes the, the, the way that the questions are constructed help uh, so I don't really answer your question Ed uh, um, but I think the, the the way that well they have a percentage figure in mind for each um, mark band and they, they put the different components together to try and do that now one of the issues and I think um, this may uh well be an issue again this year um but i think the, the there will be randomly selected schools that are sampled if, if there's any sort of massive fluctuations in grades was the the grade inflation from um 2019 to 2020 um nine to seven grades for edxl went up by 11.2 percent um now normally in a normal series they go up by approximately 2.3 2.5 percent as the students um are getting a, more used to the past papers and, and there's more past papers available but also as the teachers get more savvy in the teaching and they understand the spec more um aqa it was even higher i think it was up to 13.3 percent that grades nine to seven increased and that that is miles miles more than what it ever is i've only ever seen 2.8 as the highest and this is from marking for for 10 years now um so again depending on what comes out for for the consultation for yourselves um there will be randomly selected um schools by the exam board and to provide evidence for for what, how you have, have constructed the grade that you've awarded to the students um and then if there's any that are massively up or massively down on new centers um then they will have targeted um sampling to try and as they say offer support um to those centers so in terms of extended answers uh how do we as as teachers um help our students so 
think of the nine markers as, as a, a three by three. So I think if I was a student, it'd be less daunting. For, for AQA, I would go for a four and a five. Um, 3A01, 3A02, 3A03, that gives you nine marks. Okay, so if you put each one of those together, that helps you construct a, a developed paragraph. If you can repeat that three times, then you have the potential to score nine marks. And again, if you, if you look back at sedentary lifestyle, a uh, question that I mentioned at the start or was on there previously in terms of the amount of students, only 15 out of 21,000 getting nine marks. If you were to choose three issues, so you could look at posture, you could look at uh, muscle um, wastage, you could look at increased weight, you could look at um, bone density. You've got four areas potentially that you can look at. If you can write a developed paragraph about the the uh, application of what that would mean to the person and then ultimately the impact of it in the longer term, then you've got the potential there to score nine marks. Um, an example for AQA would be there was a, a question in the previous series about sponsorship in the media. Uh, if you could get an AO point there about um, what sponsorship or sport in the media, sorry. Um, if you could get one there for, for each of those areas, you then apply that. And then it was the question was about discuss. So in terms of discuss, if the students could put a positive and negative for each point about sport sponsorship in the media um, and sponsorship in the media, a positive and a negative, then you've got four of the AO3 points there that are available for AQA. And then a summative evaluation would tie it all together. Um, so I think that's the way that I would go. I'd develop paragraphs, either three by three or for AQA, a four and a five, then I think that helps break the question down and makes it less daunting rather than a, a nine mark question. Okay, so these are some strategies that I've, I've used with my students before. Um, these are, are very, very simple to use and they help with all questions. Um, now, I've, I've done some work about this with my students. I've done some work in my books about it. Uh, different sensors use it and I think they all find it fairly helpful so I say to my students before you answer the question identify CTC okay um, and they all went oh it's about you sir TC I was like yeah great nice one right anyway let's go on with it so this is what it stands for so the first C is the command word now in the questions that are constructed depending on the exam board for Ed Excel, it quite often is the first word that is used. For AQA, it isn't. Quite often for AQA, there'll be a sentence above that is explaining the question, and then there's a second sentence, and it's in the second sentence. But get them to identify the command word and evaluate, discuss, analyze, and justify are the most common, irrespective of the exam board, for the nine mark questions. The T in the middle stands for the topic. So that's the subject the answer is based on. So it might be a balanced diet. It might be the respiratory system. Uh, it could be uh, feedback. It could be guidance. It might be um, method of training. And then finally, the context is how the question relates to the topic. So if there is a question that is based on a balanced diet, it might be about the impact of a balanced diet on power athletes. It might be about the impact of a balanced diet on endurance athletes, that kind of thing. So depending on the context will determine what uh, format and the construction of the answer will take from the students and it will differ depending on the context. It might be that you use certain strategies to, to get the students to identify the differences. So it might be you say to each of the students when they go into an exam, you need a pencil, you need a ruler, uh, you need a highlighter. You might highlight the command word with a, a highlighter pen. You get them to circle the, the topic and you get them to underline the context. And again, that might be something that, that you share, you use with your students and you might just hammer that home. Every time you do a question for homework, I want you to CTC and then you highlight, you circle and you underline. And again, after a while, if you do this consistently and repeatedly with your students, it will become habitual and you won't have to say it at the end, they'll just do it on their own. And ultimately that is what you want them to do. You want to turn them from a, in effect, a cognitive learner to an autonomous learner, something that they just do automatically. And if you can do this from the start in year 10, then it, hopefully when they get to do their exams in year 11, then it'll just become the norm. Okay, so these are just some um, past paper questions. 
that have come up. Some of these were, were mentioned in the previous slides. These are all from MedExcel. Um, again, identify the CTCs here. Discuss the impact of a sedentary lifestyle can have on physical health. Evaluate the importance of intrinsic and extrinsic feedback for a player in an under 12 hockey team. Examine the importance of the respiratory system during the different phases shown in figures. So these, this was a picture and it was of a, a tennis player. So it was a tennis player serving. Um, it was a tennis player playing a, a forehand shot and it was a tennis player um, sat down at the break. These are dead simple to do. If you could just give this to your students as a, as a task to do and just say to them, right, identify the CTCs that are here. So first of all, the command word to get the highlighters out, the, the highlight it, they mark it, they colour it in, and then they look at, right, what have you got? Discuss, evaluate, examine. Excellent. Okay, right, the topics. What topics are we looking at? What is the main focus for the, for the answer? First one, sedentary lifestyle. Second one, you're looking at feedback. Um, and then the third one is the respiratory system. And then finally, right, what is the context? How are you going to answer the question? Well, this is looking at the impacts of sedentary lifestyle on physical health. This is looking at feedback for an under 12 hockey team, right? That's important because the feedback that you give to an under 12 player in a hockey team will be massively different than a professional footballer or a Super League netball player or a Premiership rugby player. OK, so that puts it into context. And then finally, uh, different phases of the tennis match. So um, what is the respiratory system doing during the rest break? What is it doing during the, the, the serve? What is it doing when he's running to receive a, 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 or receive the ball to play at a forehand? And that's something that you can do with your students. And you could get them to do this for any question for any marks and for any assessment objective and just get them to to get into this now you don't want them to do this for every single question because they get to the end of the, ex the exam paper and they've highlighted and done everything for all the questions and not answered any but get them into the habit pick out for the for the longer answer questions pick out for the extended writing what they're doing Okay, so strategies, what can we do to, to help them structure the questions? Okay, I always say to my students, when you are answering your question, make it a fair answer. All right, what does that mean, sir? What are you talking about? Okay, so this is what I mean. And I say fair, F-A-I-R, get them to focus on the, the, the fair aspects of the question. So the knowledge and understanding, first thing you want them to do is to tell you a fact. Okay, so if we're looking at the questions again, Tell me a fact about a sedentary lifestyle. Okay, someone who is inactive is likely to suffer from osteoporosis. That is a fact, okay? Someone who um, has got a sedentary lifestyle is likely to have issues around posture. That is a fact. That is a knowledge and understanding fact, okay? That's the first thing that you would want them to do. So you're telling them a fact. You then apply this fact, okay? You apply it to the circumstance. You apply it to the question. You then say, and this is important, this is the key driver, is that what is the impact of this fact and the application of the fact on the sport, on the sports performer and on the question? OK, so if your students are going to hit mark band three, they have to say what the impact is on the person, on the sport, on the individual. That is the key, key thing. And then they repeat it. So they repeat the question or the process over. So again, going back to a sedentary lifestyle, they've talked about osteoporosis. What are they going to do next? Right, well, I'm going to talk about posture. Okay, repeat the process. What are you going to talk about this time? You're going to talk about um, an increase in, in uh, weight or I might talk about a, la a lack of mobility. Okay, what is the application of the lack of mobility? And then what is the impact on that person? Again, for AQA, this will work to a certain degree. So you tell me a fact, so you tell me a fact about sponsorship. You apply that to the circumstance. You say what the sponsors could do for the sport or the team. And then you would say the impact. So if you're looking at a discussion, you would say a positive impact and a negative impact. So there's a four mark uh, linked answer. You then look at the media, if it was uh, AQA again. Tell me a fact about the media. What is the media? There are different forms of media that might include the television. That's a fact. That's a mark. They apply that to the impact or they apply that to the sport that they're talking about. So football. And then they say a positive and negative impact of that on the sport. 
Once again, that's four marks, that's eight marks out of nine marks already. So what does this look like in practice? Well, this is an example of, a, of an answer that a student has written, okay? So this is the kind of thing that we regularly would see. So this is related to the question that I talked about in terms of the respiratory system, in terms of um, a, a tennis player, and in terms of the impact at different phases of the game. So they're the constructing their answer. Okay, I'm not going to read it out. You can look at this at a later date, but I will come back to it in a, in a minute just to show you in terms of what we would pick out. So the answer flows, it's constructed okay, it's easy to read. And they're talking about the different phases, the different stages of a tennis match. So this bit here is about resting in between games. This allows the body to recover impact. Okay, application recovery, and you can draw long tennis games for long hours without becoming fatigued quickly. And then they're just tying it up at the end of the saying about what the respiratory system does. Okay, the respiratory system supplies a lot of amount of oxygen to the body. It's a telling me a fact. Okay, so this is picking out key points where the, the students would gain marks. Okay, so if there's a, an instance at the serve where there's a high level of intensity for a movement needed, then the respiratory system isn't really going to kick in much. It's going to, the body's going to respire anaerobically. It's, it's not going to, be able to get all the oxygen it needs. Then they start to work hard for a long period of time requiring high amounts. Of, so this is picking out areas where the students would score marks. Impact, the application, removing carbon dioxide from the body. What does the respiratory do? Well, the respiratory system do. And it's putting the link in with the heart and the lungs. When resting between games, okay, possibly looking at paying oxygen debt back will carry on breathing heavily after to replay the oxygen debt. If you're looking at AQA, you could then talk about EPOC for that instead of oxygen debt. Um, and it's the terminology that's used, the removal of lactic acid from the body. It's the technology that is specific or the, the terminology, sorry, not technology, terminology that is used that is specific that will be on the mark scheme that will gain the students the marks. The respiratory system supplies large amounts of oxygen to the body during the game. It allows the muscles, blah, blah, blah. Don't get them to write blah, 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 because that's just nonsense. Okay, compare that answer. So we've got numerous uh, parts of that that would get credit so that was a quite well constructed answer. Compare that to this, where there's not much in there that is well constructed. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I want to look at the, the things that are good, not the things that are bad. But you will get a copy of this, so you'll be able to look at it. Um, at your, if you can't get off to sleep one night, it'll put you to sleep. A bit of bedtime reading. Um, different question. Impact on physical health. Again, another one that has um, answered it well. This one, though, shows you a different way of answering the question. And it's looking at maxing out on, on AO1s because they're talking about physical activity. So not burning off and becoming overweight. That links into coronary heart disease, potentially build up of fat. Uh, impact having a sedentary liability, increased chance of developing osteoporosis. Uh, not participating in weight-bearing weight activities and long-term impact of that. So again, get the students, identify the command word, identify the topic and identify the context and get them to focus on developed paragraphs, either three for Edexcel or two longer linked paragraphs that link the uh, AO3. So you need to link the AO3s together for AQA to be able to get up into, into mark band three and this is this is a good example all right it's a bit blurred because i've blown it up so it fill the screen an impact of having a sedentary lifestyle is an increased chance of developing osteoporosis okay basic knowledge and understanding that is a fact it is an ao1 he then goes on she then goes on to say the impact or the the application of that um, which is due to not participating in weight-bearing activities, such as weightlifting, okay? Always uh, make sure if they're saying about a weight-bearing activity, the very, very simplest example of a weight-bearing activity 
is running and walking. Don't get them to say weight training. If they're going to use anything, they can say weight lifting. Um, just get them to say, the reason that I say that is because you can do exercises for weight training that are sat down and they don't necessarily need to be on their feet. Therefore, the person's bone density is reduced. Okay, that's the application of osteoporosis in later life. And they can develop osteoporosis and fractures in bones will occur more easily. Dead, dead simple. All right, three developed paragraphs for EdXL, two developed linked paragraphs for AQA. And you should be able, so that there, if that was repeated three times, that would score full marks for, for a nine mark question that only 15 people out of 21 and a half thousand were able to do. But again, think about fair fact, osteoporosis, apply bone density reduced impact potential to fracture bones repeat gain weight apply impact muscle posture apply impact lack of mobility apply impact it's dead dead simple to do but if you can do this and you can build the confidence with your students then they will find this increasingly easy one strategy you might use in terms of, of doing this, it might be, right, this is a nine mark question. I want you to do one developed paragraph. Don't have to do it as a nine marker. I want you to focus it on it as a three mark question. One developed paragraph. Then you could share that, excuse me, within the class and you might get another one uh, developed paragraph, a different point that's been made for a developed paragraph. And you can build that up and you can get the students then to share ideas. And that's a simple way of doing it to, to build confidence for your students and also build confidence in their ability to answer the questions effectively. So the developed paragraph is key. So that last paragraph clearly showed the developed paragraph idea. The first knowledge point links to the second and then feeds into the longer term impact. And again, everything that they do, get them to focus in on the impact, the long term impact. How does it impact the performance? performer how does it impact the sport how does it impact the person the individual and this is what we as teachers want our students to be able to do we want them to be able to answer like that that's what we want brilliant answer well done okay right do it again now show someone else work with someone else what have you done get them to mark each other's so not only is this what we as teachers want the students to be able able to do it's what we and now i'm putting my examiner hat on want to read you very, very, very rarely get as an examiner a good piece of work in a nine mark question. And when you do, it's brilliant. You're like, oh, finally, someone actually understands. And it's great. And it's easier to mark. It's easier to mark something that is really good as a seven, eight or a nine than it is reading through a piece of work, trying to find a one or a two or a three marks. So that's the good approach to extended answer questions. So that's the question. If you were to do it, would you be able to do it? So there's a sed sedentary lifestyle one that you could give the students that as the example and then say, right, have a go. Choose something else now. Don't use the osteoporosis. Use something else. We've got loads to go at. Weight gain, high blood pressure, coronary heart disease. You could link that into the impact of coronary heart, heart disease and ultimately it might lead to a premature death. Um, loads to go out there and you could use that with your students repeat it can you do one right can you do another and this is all you would do within your exam okay someone mentioned uh coming to the end now uh, someone mentioned resources that would help with this um here's one i prepared earlier for you so to speak um so the bbc bite size that's on uh the the bite size uh, website in terms of the students can access that. Um, this second one, this is a Pearson specific one, so an EdXL one. This is on the short course spec, uh, but if you go to page 45, I think it's 45 uh, on there, that's um, where you can access the, the taxonomy of command words. And then if you go on to the um, file store for AQA that you should have access to, then there's the command words uh, the PDF that you can get on there. It might be you use the one that I've given. If you want to use um, board specific ones, then you can use them as well. It's entirely up to you. But my advice would be if you can get your students to understand the command word, then that's half the battle. Then what you need to do is get them to, to put the command word in with the topic and the context and then fulfill this developed paragraph idea 
you're on the right lines then and that will help you ultimately or help your students okay so that's the developed paragraph idea that's the scaffolding idea for for extended answers if you've got any questions i'll have a look in the, the box again i think i've answered uh, most of them but if you've got any more questions now uh with regards to the the extended answer the way to scaffold that kind of thing if you wanted to to ask them uh, Tony, just um, a question on behalf of those that are, are new to teaching GCSE or, or A-level. Um, okay. What's the best way to get personalised feedback about your cohort and how they've done, rather than just the examiner's report, which is quite obviously general? Um, okay, so... What would you um, recommend? Yeah, so if you um, speak to your exams officer, um, for Edexcel, there is a service called uh, Results Plus. There is the equivalent one, I can't remember off the top of my head, which is the one for AQA. Um, I've got it on some uh, work that I've just done with some Fabicia schools. At, so I'll, I'll email you, Ed, what, what that's called. Um, if you uh, get access to Results Plus, you go onto it, it will give you a paper one and a paper two breakdown of your class your cohort that you've had at your school and it will say um question 14 like that it'll give you all your students that have done it and it will tell you how many marks out of nine those students have got and it will break it should break it down into the assessment objectives as well um, because when we're marking we get three boxes and they'll, they'll get the same for aqa too so for for a nine mark question you'll mark out of three, three and three. So you don't mark it just out of nine, you mark it out of three, three and three. That then gives you your breakdown for each student in your class, what they've got for the nine mark questions. It's this, it does it for all the, the questions. It then gives you the average for the cohort for exam PE, for Edexcel, for AQA in total. So it might say that um, the average score for question 14 was, uh, 3.9 you you can then work out the average score for your cohort your class and then the average score per student in that class so that would be the the best way to do it i would say if you haven't got if you're not using results plus at the moment then i would get access to that and, and use it because it will massively inform your planning and um, moving forward thank you okay just see what else is just coming Um, Tom, um, you could use uh, storyboards for that, I would think. Um, so um, something that came out a couple of years ago was uh, it was about using storyboards. So what you could do for that that question, and again, we'll, we'll stick to this sedentary lifestyle one because that was the, the last one that I talked about. Um, break it down into the assessment objectives. So you might have a, a picture of a broken bone. Um, you might have a, a picture of um, a massive plate of food. You might have a picture of a heart. You might have a picture of someone who's, who's uh, sort of poor posture bent over. And then you could get them <clears throat> to use that for the, the facts, the recall, the knowledge and understanding, and then link it through. So what you could do is you could, you could in effect, plan out, map out the answer and just put pictures in there that your students could use as prompts. Um, a tool, if you're giving them feedback, um as you say saying for that in terms of a bit of feedback um there's on um google chrome there's a, a an extension for verbal feedback called moat um if you use that it's it's free to download it's an extension on the browser um if you get your students to submit the answers on google docs um then you can give them verbal feedback now the good thing um with that is if you're um working overseas if you're working with students um, that English is an additional language or a second language, um, then there's an option to, to upgrade. I think it's about £39 um, and it will translate your verbal feedback into written feedback in 20 languages. Um, so that's something that may be worth looking into. Um, and it, it, you can, when you do the verbal feedback for each part of their answer, you can record up to a 90 second clip. So the feedback that you can give them is hugely more detail than would potentially be given if you were in effect marking um, and it also allow it's massive time saver as well so I, I would look at that um, so a google chrome extension called moat um, not sure if you use it or if you've seen it but 
one of the things that has come out of this this lockdown, in my opinion, are, are all these apps and and changes to tech. But in my opinion, that is that is brilliant. Um, Moat M O T E. Okay, has anyone got any any more questions? This is the bit where everyone's thinking it's tea time. I want to go now. Get me get me tea. Um, but if you've got any questions, please feel free to to ask them. I think that might be it, Tony. I think we might be done. Um, I think you, Tony made it very, very clear um, what we all need to do, CTCs and the FAIR model. Um, I think certainly everyone will take that away with them. Um, there is another question just popped up here at the end. Uh, Thomas, um, so this, for everyone that's watching um, and didn't make it, this is being recorded and will be uploaded to the DXPP YouTube channel um, by tomorrow at the latest. Not going to do it this evening. We'll do it tomorrow. Um, there's more to come um, from from Tony um, on examination PE. Uh, we're working together on putting a, a calendar of events across an academic year, so we can do specific events that are timely to where you'll be in the course. So that might be going to be designed strategically around when you're about to do your coursework or your PEPs or different things like that. So these webinars will come at times when you really need them or they're going to be on your mind. So uh, we're working on that for, for next year. Um, also from DASA and DXBPE, um, we've got things in the pipeline for the remainder of this term, um, focusing around leadership, curriculum design, and lots of other bits and bobs. So uh, keep an eye on those social medias. Um, keep an eye on your inbox for emails from me or from the, from the DASA email uh, to find out more about this. Um, as, as I've been talking, a few more questions have come through. Uh, James about the PowerPoint, yet yeah, Tony's gonna share the PowerPoint with me. It will be in PDF uh, format, uh, but I'll make sure the links are separate to that for those resources Tony shared at the end, so you can get to, get to them alongside the, uh, the recording. And, um, What's this from John? Would there be any chance to do something similar in moderating practicals? Um, Tony, want to answer that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I've got um, something, especially at the moment in terms of um, where we're at, in terms of everyone's got to potentially for next year as well, look at submitting um, video footage. Um, because obviously for the last year, the, the moderation visits were cancelled first before the exams were cancelled. Um, I would imagine for overseas centres that the video moderation will be uh, continued next year as well to try and limit travel really. But yeah, that's um, something we can look at. I've got footage in terms of uh, drills that would be good to use in terms of pro pro progressive, put my teeth in, progressive drills in terms of static drills, um, ones that show uh, examples of a competitive formal situation, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's not a problem. We could we could look at doing something like that, and that's something that I can speak to you about down the line. Yeah, me and Tony spoke about that last week. Actually, talking about how frustrating it can be as a, a busy moder visiting moderator, and the drills just not being good enough to let these kids get the top marks. Yeah. So um, when moderation is on the horizon, that's when we'll do that session for you all, so you can. Um, get the best out of your kids and your students. But I think that's everything. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, me and Tony will stay on the line until you've all left, just in case. But uh, have a lovely evening. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. I'll stop recording, Tony.